Hello, and welcome to Discovering True Health, your weekly deep dive into health and wellness. Thank you so much for joining us today. Please hit that subscribe button. It helps us out a lot, and you'll stay up to date on all our upcoming shows. You can also check out additional information on our website, Instagram, and Facebook. All those links are below. So today, we're going to be learning about body type science and how it relates to diet, exercise, and metabolism and how to use body type science to safely and effectively lose weight. We'll also be talking about what skinny fat is and how to combat it. So my guest today is Mark Nelson. He is the lead scientific researcher at Fellow One Research and has pioneered body type science since 2003. And their mission is to help overcome the global health crisis, including the obesity epidemic. So thank you so much for joining me today, Mark. Thank you for having me. Now your own personal journey and experience as a child led you to researching body type science. Can you share with us a little about your journey and how it led you to the work you're doing today and what you learned along the way in regards to body type science? So when I was about eight years old, I was actually a star soccer player on a state championship team. I, I was one of the star soccer players. And I began noticing during shirts off practice that there was something odd about my body. I was lacking muscle and muscle mass all over. And this was the mid 1980s. So uh, we didn't have terms like skinny fat or normal weight obesity. The BMI had just become the official standard in 1985. So when I would go in for my doctor checkups, because I was such an active child, I was always within, well within my safe BMI weight range. And when I would bring up why I have all this fat all over my body, even though I'm skinny, no one cared because I was within my safe BMI weight range. And that was really the only standard that the doctors used. So as time passed, I hit age 10 and you know, 12 and I hit puberty and everyone said, oh, you'll end up growing muscle. Don't worry about it. But instead, I just grew more fat and the fat became more and more of a problem to a point where I couldn't play sports anymore because if you don't have muscle and muscle mass on your body, you can't play sports well. That's what makes an athletic body. So I, I couldn't run as fast. I couldn't run as long. And it didn't matter how much training I did. I wasn't lazy. I went out and jogged miles daily. I took up weightlifting probably earlier than I should. Um, and none of it helped. I, I, it was nearly impossible to put the muscle mass on my body. And I was up against people who actually were a body type one uh, in terms of the standard, the standard scientific human body anatomy book, body type one. They were a body type one. They did have all of the muscle and muscle mass on their body. So as the years passed and I got to college, I was determined to figure out why and to fix my body because when you're lacking muscle and muscle mass, you're an easy target for bullying because you're small and you're weak. So I was bullied relentlessly at home, on the way to school, at school, on the way back from school, at home again. And I just was fed up with all of it. So when I hit college, I uh, there were a group of friends who were all into weightlifting and they were taking supplements and they were eating a certain diet. So I mirrored all that because I was determined to fix my body. But it just didn't matter. I, I did the same weightlifting exercises that all of them did. I did the same supplements, the same meals, and they would just get more ripped and I would just deal with more skinny fat on my body. And it wasn't like I didn't add a little bit of muscle mass, but I went from having a sparrow's chest to having a raven's chest. And it was like, you know, it just wasn't the return on the investment in terms of the effort that I was putting in. So that was towards the end of college and I just was at my wits end. And that's really when I began the real research on body type science. Cause I had tried the, tried to identify my body type as uh, my an endomorph, an ectomorph or a mesomorph, but there was no science behind any of those. And it was basically just arbitrary shapes that were subjective. And it was like, am I an apple? Am I a pear? Well, I'm not any of those things. I, and so I didn't identify with any of that. And as I, as I left college, I, I took a job at CU uh, up in Boulder as a scientific researcher. And that was re what really galvanized me to want to do my own research. And that's when I began the Fellow One research in 2003. So I'll, I'll sort of 
pause there and see if that answered your question and if I'm making any sense. No, absolutely. That's, um, I can relate with that because I, you know, I, I have like my arms, I can build muscle, my legs from my knees up, my upper legs. It's like, you know, I have done fitness competitions. I have box for four years. I've done high level, you know, athlete training and cannot get the fat off, cannot build, can't seem to build muscle. And then I have girlfriends who barely work out. Maybe some don't for a long time and they have toned upper, le upper legs and you can see like the muscle kind of there and it's lean and I just can't, no matter what I do. So I can really, really relate to that. And it's, I feel like a lot of people can relate to your story because it's that frustration, like, okay, <laughs> I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. I'm eating the, you know, I'm doing the right diet. I'm doing the exercises and the weight training and the cardio. And it's like, why am I not getting there? What's going on now? Can you explain to us what body type science is that you've been researching and you have come up with four body types. Can you walk us through what those four body types are that you've discovered in your research? Indeed. So let me start with the body type standards that mainstream science and medical doctors use, because that's something that isn't clear for most people. And it's a standard that you and I are being held to, even though, as we just both stated in our stories, we don't have the fully developed muscle all over our body, like mainstream science and medical doctors claim that we do once we're within our safe BMI weight range. So it's how mainstream science and medical doctors determine body type. There are three standards. The first standard is the scientific human body anatomy book body type one that you find in any scientifically approved human body anatomy book. And it's that image in your mind's eye that you see that is the human body with all of the muscle and muscle mass fully developed front and back. And when you go and see your doctor, that's the image that you're being held to. That's the standard that you and 100% of every human being is being held to. Yet, as I just stated, and you just stated, I have never had all the muscle relative to that standard. And so that's, that's the first standard. And the reason that it's not accurate is because it is a scientific fact that any part of the human body can be underdeveloped to whatever degree. Mm -hmm. So that's standard number one. Standard Number two is body mass index, BMI, which as stated earlier, came into existence, uh, it came into existence in the 1800s, but it became the standard in 1985. And that standard is not accurate for several reasons. One, because as I just stated, any part of the human body can be underdeveloped, which means that if you are within your safe BMI weight range, yet you are dealing with skinny fat, skinny fat being cellulite, thin fat, loose skin, saggy skin, crepey skin, normal weight obesity. If you're dealing with any of that on your body, yet you are within your safe BMI weight range, then you have underdeveloped muscle mass and that is genetics. And so that's one reason why BMI is not accurate. Another reason is it is possible like Dwayne Johnson, The Rock and so many other uh, large males and even females who have excess muscle and muscle mass on their bodies, who if they were to calculate their BMI, they likely would fall into the overweight or obese categories of their BMI, but they most certainly are not overweight or obese. They simply have excess muscle mass on their body. So that is standard number two and why it is not accurate. The third standard is the BMR, the basal metabolic rate. That is the number of calories that your body requires daily to just function, to, to, to do its basic function. So we know that skinny fat is a very real thing, yet the standard Mifflin St. Gior and the uh, standard Mifflin, uh, excuse me, Harris Benedict activity BMRs do not calculate in skinny fat. So if you are using the standard BMR calculation to figure out how many calories, the base number of calories that you need daily, you're likely still eating too many calories if you have skinny fat on your body where there's muscle and muscle mass, because science recognizes that one pound of muscle mass burns six calories daily, but one pound of fat or skinny fat only burns two to three calories. So if you have skinny fat on your body, you're, you are well within your, your safe BMI, then you likely don't need as many calories as your standard BMR is telling. So those are the three mainstream science and medical doctor standards that every human being is, is held to. 
uh, and why they are not accurate. So I'll, I'll sort of pause there and see if I've made sense. And then if I have, I'll move on to the four by types and how we came to those. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I think what I found was interesting in my research for the show, when I was reading your research, I was like, why are these unscientific? I've never, you know, that's something I haven't heard of. And we kind of accept all these things because, you know, we go to the doctor and this is, you know, what we're told and we, we just don't know where they came from. I think it's really important. Like you, you just mentioned, like BMI was really a standard that happened in the eighties, which I didn't know until you just said that. Um, and also in my research, I found out that the three body types that you had mentioned, the um, ectomorph, mesomorph, and endomorph, they were created in the forties by a psychologist named Dr. William Sheldon. And he thought body size and shape helped to determine personality traits, right. like aggressiveness, assertiveness, shyness, sensitivity. He was obviously wrong, but somehow these three main body types kind of lived on. They've evolved a bit since then. Some other scientists, I think, got involved and created, you know, a more specific assessment around them, but they're still pretty, like you said, they're, um, they're not accurate. So anyhow, I thought that was interesting, but yeah, let's talk about your four body types that you've, um, discovered in your research. So one final thing on those three body types, they were most certainly debunked way back when, and they are not based on any science. But the thing is, is that we want, as human beings, we want to understand our body. And because there was no body type science prior to 2003, those were the only real standards. Now, there are other quote unquote body types like the kibby body types, uh, the hormone body types, the triangle body types, the 10 body types, and none of those are based on science either. It is true that hormones affect your body. So we're not arguing that point. They most certainly affect you know, weight loss and weight gain and such. But we have hundreds of quizzes up on our site now. And we have, and many of those quizzes are by type two, three, and four people who have never been diagnosed with any hormone imbalance or not dealing with a doctor diagnosed hormone imbalance, have never been diagnosed with any structural imbalance like scoliosis or, or, or the like. And so if it were, if hormone biotypes were a real thing, then that then the individuals dealing with a hormone imbalance would have been diagnosed by their doctor. And that would help explain at least why they have a weight uh, fluctuation issue or it's hard for them to keep weight off. But it most certainly would not explain structural issues in the body because once the body is de developed, again, according to mainstream science and medical doctors, you are a biotype one. All human beings are a biotype one. So hormones wouldn't affect your structure, they would simply affect how you put on weight and how that weight fluctuates over time. And even then, again, as already stated, so many of our scientific quiz participants have never been diagnosed with any hormone issues, yet they still deal with skinny fat all over their, their, their body. So that brings us to our four body types and how we came to it. So as already stated, it is a scientific fact uh, that any part of the human body can be underdeveloped. It's also a scientific fact that every vertebra houses a specific set of muscles. So if any of those muscles relative to a specific vertebra are underdeveloped, that will directly affect your posture, along with your metabolism, including BMR. And so we looked at it in terms of, and we have uh, hundreds of um, quizzes up on our site now. And you can see from those quizzes, the difference in terms of backs. We have lots of biotype ones, lots of biotype twos, lots of biotype threes, and lots of biotype fours. And all of them, you can see the, the difference in the muscle mass makeup in terms of their back. Mm -hmm. So we broke down biotype in terms of vertebrae. There are 26 vertebrae in your back. There's really 33 relative to the, uh, the bone in terms of the vertebrae, but they are broken down into 26 vertebrae that are uh, seven cervical, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, one sacrum, and one coccyx. That's 26 vertebrae. So we broke down by type in terms of a by type one. It's just a by type one. It has zero under developed vertebrae in terms of muscle and muscle mass. The biotype two has one to eight underdeveloped vertebrae in terms of muscle and muscle mass. A biotype three is 
9 to 17, and the biotype 4 is 18 to 26. We don't claim right now that that is set in stone. We had to start somewhere because, again, all that we human beings want is to understand things. And science breaks things down in terms of categories to help define them better. So our goal was to find a way to help people understand how how can I understand my actual biotype relative to what the science actually says? So it, is all that making sense? Absolutely. The I guess the question I have when you talk about underdeveloped vertebrae, so it's not the actual vertebrae bone that's underdeveloped. It is the muscles around that vertebrae. Can you explain a little bit more? Right. Now, it is definitely possible for the vertebrates itself to be underdeveloped. That's really what scoliosis is. And the more extreme the, the scoliosis, the more underdeveloped the vertebrae. But, and so we really focus on both, but we, we have a tendency to focus more on the muscle and, and, and the actual muscle mass, because where you have underdeveloped muscle and muscle mass, that's where in place of that is skinny fat. And we know this. So I just had a, a guest on our podcast, uh, the Biotype Science Podcast, and he's doing excellent work up in Canada. And he's working with school age children. And they are they have a, a set of tests, scientific tests that can calculate out what the load is for each student in terms of their muscle and muscle mass, what they're capable of doing in terms of um, resistance exercise. So pull ups and push ups. And the, and the like, which they can then calculate out the amount of muscle and muscle mass, which then they can equate to specific exercises in terms of intensity and duration and such. And so they are showing just like we are that muscle mass or a lack of muscle mass is a very real thing. It directly affects your day to day life. And we are, are simply breaking it down in terms of the four body types, in terms of vertebra and muscle mass in skinny fat because that just was the logical path to get here. And so again, if you go up on our site, we have some excellent, uh, some excellent imaging that shows a biotype one next to a biotype two, next to a biotype three, next to a biotype four. And you can clearly see that a biotype one is most certainly a biotype one. They look just like the standard scientific human body anatomy book biotype one. Yet a biotype two doesn't so much. And the biotype three, much more or less. And the biotype four doesn't look anything like a standard scientific human body anatomy book biotype one. So is that more clear? Absolutely. Yeah. I was confused about the, the vertebrae, like the underdeveloped vertebrae term, like what exactly that meant. So it's basically um, lack of muscle development, basically from birth. It's a genetic, it's, it's tied to your genetics and you were born with lack of like um, underdeveloped muscle in certain areas of your body. That's correct. And that's an important point to make because we have so many people who use our scientific weight loss diary who once they've lost the weight, they get down into their safety and my weight range and they're missing muscle mass all, all, all over their body. And in place of it is skinny fat. What they think is they must have lost that muscle and muscle mass during the weight loss process. But that is not a scientific fact. It is a scientific fact that there is no evidence whatsoever that if you safely lose weight, that your body does not. It most certainly does not break down muscle and muscle mass. Now, if you're starving your body, if you are not losing weight safely, then your body will break down muscle and muscle mass because you're starving it and it has to survive. It has to find calories somewhere. But if you are safely losing weight, like we have a um, participant, 1170. She's in her early twenties. She did a great job. She, she did a healthy diet, exercise and lifestyle. She lost 19 pounds and got down to the mid range of her safe BMI weight range. Yeah. She still has skinny fat all over her body. And when she started, she thought that once she got down into her safe BMI weight range, that she would look just like the standard scientific human body of 90 book by type one, because that's what her doctor told her. Oh yeah. All you gotta do is just drop the calories, get down into your safe BMI, and you're going to look just like a, a biotype woman. But yeah. she doesn't. Oh, no muscle. <laughs> Where is no that? muscle. And that's it. And she really thought that she was, that she simply had uh, lost that muscle and muscle mass in, in her weight loss process. But that is scientifically not how it works if you are losing muscle and muscle mass safely. So yes, most people are just from, from day one because of their 
genetics. They simply don't have that muscle and muscle mass on their body. And in place of it is some form of skinny fat. Right. Now, for those who are not born with the standard body type one with all the developed muscle, in what ways does that affect their life physiologically oh, and all the other ways? So let's just start with something like sports, right. um, because it's something that most people can genuinely relate to. So if you are someone like me who I love soccer. I would have, I, I would still be playing soccer had I had the muscle mass to actually play it. But I use the analogy that if you think of somebody like David Beckham, he's a body type one. He was a star soccer player because he was a body type one and because he had actual skill and talent as well. Because there are plenty of body type one folks out there who just don't have the skill and talent and they'll never be a star soccer player. So, but he was a body type one, and because he was a body type one, he had all of the muscle and, and muscle mass. Because and muscle and muscle mass helps generate speed, agility, its strength. So, if you're out on the field, all of those things matter in terms of being a star soccer player. And because I lacked all of those things, I was being held to the standard that I would, that 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 I was a, a body type one. So, when I was out on the field, I was being held to keeping up with a David Beckham, who in my analogy is a Lamborghini. Right. I was a Dodge Caravan. I, there's no way I could ever compete with a Lamborghini. And I'm not knocking a Dodge Caravan. It serves its purpose in the world. But if you put a Dodge Caravan, a standard factory Dodge Caravan up against a standard factory Lamborghini, the Lamborghini wins that race 100% of the time. And that's just a fact. You're not going to change that because that's just how it is. So I was out on the field and I was being held to that standard that I should be able to compete with all these Lamborghinis. And the only reason that I wasn't, be, I wasn't able to win the, the, the race and, and compete with them was because I wasn't working hard enough. But there was no amount of effort that I could have ever put in because I was lacking so much muscle and muscle mass to ever compete with a David Becker. So that is one way that lacking muscle and muscle mass makes a huge difference. So I'll sort of pause there and see if I'm making sense. Absolutely. Yeah, it does make a lot of sense. Um, I mean, it really, it, it, it sounds like, is it something that we can overcome, but, or once we're lacking that muscle mass, it's, it's not possible to get to that Lamborghini level. It's tough. I mean, it's, it, so Anyone who has skinny fat on their body, like you were saying earlier, you, you, you've put in a, you know, a lot of effort to get rid of that skinny fat where you have on your body. And it was nearly impossible, if not impossible, because the skinny fat is extremely difficult to, to get rid of. Mainstream science says it's not possible to get rid of it because once a fat cell develops in your body, it's there for life. Uh. We don't necessarily agree with that stance because we, think that uh, the understanding of the human body right now is very limited in terms of our young human science. And we, uh, and I, I actually have been doing my own proprietary exercises for the last 20 years. And I have most certainly built muscle and, and muscle mass and gotten rid of skinny fat. Uh, I wish I could talk more about that, but I, I don't, I can't really safely do that right now because it's still in the experimental stage. But I would say that it is most certainly possible to change your genetics. And as we learn more about our genetics in terms of things like CRISPR, we right. know that this is true, but it is not easy. And right now there really are no exercises that one can point to, to actually do that. We know that weightlifting can help. The problem with things like weightlifting though, is it's a repetition exercise. So what happens when you do the repetition exercise and you build muscle and, and then you stop doing those repetition exercises that okay. muscle goes away. Right. And that's how it works. Okay. Right. So, so what, what we are doing is we're working with gravity because gravity is, is the actual weight that's pushing down on your body every second of every day that your body is working against to help maintain muscle and muscle mass. Wow. We know that that is a fact because when an astronaut goes into space, they have to work extra hard to do cardio and resistance exercise to maintain their muscle mass, their bone mass, their teeth mass. And when they come back to earth, even when they do all of that 
exercise in space, they likely still have lost muscle and muscle mass and bone mass, and they have to do extra work when they come back. So that's how we know that gravity is the best weight to actually work against. So really it's exercises like yoga, because yoga is really about doing a form of calisthenics with a form of isometrics where you're using gravity and you're actually holding the body against gravity. So if you can learn how to do yoga first and get to know your spine well, and even incorporate weightlifting relative to yoga, and then translate that to an, an, an upright state where you're working on your posture. And if somebody says, stop slouching, you'll pull your shoulders back and you'll hold it. Well, it's really no, no different in terms of yoga, only you're doing it in a standing up process so that you're using gravity against your body. And as you build that muscle relative to gravity, unlike weightlifting, where you're doing the repetition exercises, you now have gravity that is pushing against your body. And those muscles will more likely stay with you for the rest of your life because it's gravity that is pushing down and your body has to work against that gravity. So am I making sense? So it's a combination of, you know, really getting your back working, working the muscles in your back and getting those, your spine and your back stabilized, um, along with everything else. Cause if yeah. you're not doing the back and you're not, you know, building those muscles and getting those muscles that are weakened or, or missing where the vertebrae are, it doesn't matter how many squats you do. <laughs> and, and you could likely put on muscle mass relative to squats. But so I had a, I, I had a roommate in, in college who was a weightlifting freak and he was determined to look like Brad Pitt. Hmm. The only problem was, was he was missing muscle mass from likely his lower thoracic down to his sacrum. And so when he would do his weightlifting, which he did religiously, he definitely put on muscle, but it was anywhere where he really already had muscle mass. So his body became more, uh, a, symmetrical and he would put on muscle where he already had muscle, but where he was lacking muscle mass, he had a really hard time putting on muscle. Mass. So as he put on more a, a more weight, he actually looked more like a ball of muscle, literally a ball of muscle instead of like Brad Pitt, because he wasn't putting on that actual muscle mass relative to where he was lacking it. And so that's really the issue with a standard weightlifting routine, whether you're doing squats or whatever is you will have tendencies, strong tendencies to put on muscle mass where you already have muscle because those muscles will take over for any area of your body that may be lacking muscle and muscle mass. And you will have a tendency to put on muscle where you already have it and less of a tendency where you have skinny fat. And you likely know that because again, you, you have the areas on your body where no matter what you did, you, you couldn't seem to put on muscle where you had skinny fat, but you didn't have any issues putting on muscle where you already had it. I have the same issue on my body. Right. And I think where I really noticed it in my life was I, I had, like I said, I've been training like an athlete my entire life. I started very young in my twenties. I did fitness competitions. I was a boxer. I almost went amateur. I, you know, train hard in the gym, you know, four or five days a week through that. And then at one point recently, a couple of years ago, I got an ankle injury. And I was at literally out for about eight months to a year. I was still trying to do some workout. I didn't change my diet. I was still doing like arm cardio and stuff like that. But my legs just, I mean, the fat that suddenly appeared on my body, like I was like, I was so mad because I was like, I have worked out so hard my entire life. How is it in like less than a year, my upper legs and my lower stomach is just like completely ballooned out um, in that short period of time when I've put in that amount of time training those muscles and building those muscles. It really blew my mind and it was really frustrating and confusing. And so when you went to your doctor, did you ask them why you were so easily putting on fat where you should have muscle and uh, were you within your safe BMI weight range? What did they say? Because again, according to mainstream science and medical doctors, once you're within your safe BMI weight range, you look identical to a, to a biotype one. Yet right. when I go in and I ask them about why they have no answer for me. Yeah. So, yeah. You know. I mean, it was more like, well, you know, muscle atrophies when you're not moving around and, you know, um, you're sitting around more. So your body's going to, you know, 
build more fat. So you need to, you know, your muscles are stuck together and you're not, you know, you need, you need, you just need to get, you know, work out again and start doing some, some exercises and build the muscles. But I was so confused how those muscles seem to just disappear so quickly after a, a lifetime of training them. And, and that's why, and I, and I would say that I would, I would argue that point with them that the muscle atrophies, because so we have a section up on our site called um, uh, celebrity body types. And there are, are, are celebrities that are a, are a body type one and you can go and you can see and who knows how much effort they actually put in. But if you go with somebody like um, Elizabeth Hurley, she claims that she doesn't do any working out whatsoever. She's in her late fifties and she is most certainly a body type one. Who knows how much Botox or Sculpta or, Know, what other stuff that she's done, but I have to question whether it's true that the muscle just atrophies. How old were you when the doc when that happened, and the doctor told you that muscle just atrophies when when you're sitting around? Uh, let's see. I was like 38, I believe. So you were right on the edge of of of, uh, of turning 40, but you hadn't really turned 40 yet, and that would be the point where I would say, okay, I might. Uh, agree with that statement because once you turn 40 it is true that you begin to lose muscle mass now all things relative even though it's a gradual loss over time but uh, uh, until you hit 40 the human body just doesn't have a tendency to lose muscle mass like that so uh, you were you were you were right there on the edge so who knows it, it, it could be but i just i i like to stick with the science and if you know if, if any of your listeners wants to bring forward any studies or, or research that shows that in your younger years, that if you're just lazy and sit around that you'll lose muscle and muscle mass. I don't think that that's true. So anyways, um, yeah. yeah. Well, like I said, it goes back to having friends who don't work out yeah, or rarely work out and they have toned thin legs. There you go. <laughs> and I've worked out my whole life and I took, less than a year off from an injury and I'm suddenly fat and have that bunch of fat and not skinny anymore or not. Right. Tired. And yeah, so that, that didn't make sense to me. So it makes sense what you're saying. So it, uh, I, I, I would always love, I, mean, I would love to have a, a doctor on the show uh, and, and be able to ask them that question because it, it, it doesn't sound like you got a straight answer. I have never gotten a straight answer when I go in and ask yeah. my doctor about why do I have all this on my body? Anyways. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit more about skinny fat. So we understand how, do, how does it, you know, is it detrimental to our overall health? If so, how, um, and what can we do about it? Is there, is there anything we can specifically do about it? Can we ever get rid of it? So uh, is it detrimental to health? Um, it definitely affects our, our metabolism, especially our, our, our BMR, um, which then, of course, would play into our diet. Um, evolutionary, there's no, science can find no evolutionary reason for skinny fat. Mm -hmm. So if, if you think about it, if we, you know, way back when, when we were you know, out on the open plains and we were hunter gatherers. And if we were walking across that, that open plain and we ran across a lion or something, right? Who's going to get eaten first. It's going to be the person who runs the slowest. Why would you run the slowest? Because you're lacking muscle mass where you should have you know, muscle mass. And in place of it is skinny fat. So even though I get a lot of people who say, well, but you know, the, the human body has to store fat because in lean times, you know, so it's, 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 it's the reason why I have love handles or it's, it's the reason why I have fat here or there. And I would argue that point that, okay, so what you're saying then is that by type one people don't have any fat storage because as you just said, you have friends who they can do hardly anything and they're fully toned always. So are we saying that they don't have any fat storage? Cause that just isn't, that's just not true. They will certainly have fat storage. You just can't see it because the, the human body is extremely efficient. It's an amazing, I don't want to call it a machine because it's not, it's just an amazing creation. And so it most certainly over, over just the evolutionary process had to find a way to store fat because there most certainly were lean times 
like you have a savings account when there are, are, are lean times in terms of paying bills and such, your body has to be able to turn to something without burning muscle and muscle mass. So it would definitely store fat. So skinny fat, again, has no evolutionary purpose. We can't find one. So it, it, how new is it? Because our, our science is so young, we haven't been tracking it. We just came up with the term skinny fat and normal weight obesity in the last decade or so. So how far back has, has the human body dealt with skinny fat? We know that, say, in ancient Rome, that they were most certainly fat people obese people, did they have skinny fat on their body or were they just gluttons and they just overate? Who really knows? Uh, So I would say that skinny fat most certainly is detrimental to health in that it affects our metabolism. It affects our ability to play sports. It affects our ability just day to day. Muscle is the armor of the human body. So it allows us to hold the energy. Uh, So if we think about holding the energy, if we think about somebody like Will Smith, who cracked under the pressure at at the Oscars, if you are lacking muscle and muscle mass, you, especially the more famous that, that you become, the more fat you will likely put on your body because it takes muscle to hold energy. If you're lacking that muscle and muscle mass, then you most likely uh, won't be able to hold the energy as well. And if you become more famous, like a Melissa McCarthy or such, you most likely will begin to put on more fat mass because that helps you hold the energy. So that's another way where if you're lacking muscle and muscle mass, it's going to affect your day to day life because you just can't hold the energy as well. You just can't stand the pressure as well. So I would say that, sorry. No, that's so fascinating. So it's basically, if if you're not a body type one, if you're lacking the muscle mass in order to hold the energy, you'll put on more fat. Right. You will have strong tendencies to put on more fat. If you're body type one, you won't because you have the muscle in order that, that can hold the energy. Right. And so there is a, there's an excellent image up on our website of Joe Rogan. Uh, when he was being fat shamed for being fat. And you can see all of the, like that dude's 100% muscle. He's all muscle. And when he was quote unquote fat, you can see that he's got a little bit of fat on his stomach, but you can, you can obviously see all of the muscle and, and muscle mass under the little bit of fat that he was being fat shamed for. Hmm. If you, and then we have an, an image right next to that image of, of James Corden. And you can see that that dude is missing muscle mass from like his mid thoracic down to his sacrum and there's no muscle or muscle mass underneath his fat he's just got fat where there should be muscle and muscle mass and those are really telling images because a a body type one like they really have to let themselves go to become overweight or obese and it's obvious even when they are that they are still a body type one because they have all that muscle and muscle mass so uh is that making sense yeah, I mean, what, what was just going through my mind was it, it sounds like it also correlates to, you know, you were talking about the holding the energy or, or stress or high stress situations in life. That would explain why some people gain weight or be, gain fat during really stressful or negative experiences in life as well. I mean, I'm sure there's other things that go into it, like the eating and, and all that kind of stuff. But Right. Yes. No. And it, so and I definitely don't want to. And not add in that you are right. It, it's it, it can be diet and overeating and such. Uh, but yes, that is very true. That if you are lacking muscle and muscle mass, and you start to see more success in your life, and, you, and there's more pressure for you to perform, the tendencies are much higher that you will put on excess fat weight relative to where you have that skinny fat. Whereas if you didn't, if you just had the muscle or muscle mass. You're just not going to deal with that. At least the probabilities are much lower that you will deal with that. Yes. Fascinating. Now we're currently in what they're calling a obesity crisis or epidemic. And from your research, are there any correlations between body type science and the ob- current obesity crisis happening in the U.S.? Oh, most certainly. Um, so most people just want to say that the obesity epidemic is because there's so many lazy people who are overeating. 
And there is some truth in that. There are definitely too many, especially Americans who just abuse their diet, exercise, and lifestyle and just aren't doing the work. But there are also plenty of people like me and folks over at the Brookhaven Obesity Clinic who have done the work. They lost the weight. And there are some excellent examples at the Brookhaven Obesity Clinic where there was one guy, I'm going to forget his name, but he lost like four, 500 pounds and got down into his safe BMI weight range, but he had skinny fat all over his body and he had loose, saggy skin and he just couldn't keep the weight off because he just didn't have any muscle mass. And he didn't know that because he didn't have any muscle mass, it was going to be impossible for him to, to keep that weight off because like me, when he lost all the weight and was in his safe BMI weight range, he felt terrible. He, he was greatly depressed. He had digestive issues. He had heartburn. There was just all these health issues. And then when I put the weight on and I was up at around 300 pounds, I felt the best I had ever felt in my life, but I hated how I looked. I hated how I looked and I knew that being obese was not healthy, but I felt the best I had ever felt in my entire life when I was that heavy. And it's the same story that you hear from all these folks at the Brookhaven Obesity Clinic where they lose the weight, they get down within their safe BMI weight range, everyone's all proud of them and the doctors are happy with their progress, but they feel terrible and they can't keep the weight off because they don't have the muscle or muscle mass and the probabilities are just astronomically high that they're going to put the weight on. So obesity directly correlates to how much skinny fat you have on your body. And you can definitely do the work, do the exercise, do find a proper diet and keep that weight off, but it's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort. And like you said, you have these friends who they don't have to do anything and they look great in a, uh, in a swimsuit out on the beach. Yet there are folks like you and I, who we work our butt off and it's like, I, I don't feel comfortable going out on the beach, uh, especially when I'm next to somebody who looks so great. So you have a direct correlation to skinny fat and obesity that needs to be looked at and addressed so that we can help people understand your body type most certainly matters. So does your diet, so does your exercise, so does your lifestyle, but you can do all those things perfectly. Find the perfect diet for you where you're eating the right amount of calories daily relative to your uh, to your um, BMR. And we have a uh, we have our own calculations relative to BMR in terms of our scientific biotype quiz, where we give the standard BMR and then we also give the adjusted BMR, which calculates in skinny fat. But you can get that right. You can get your exercise right. You can get your lifestyle right. And yet still, you will be a biotype two, three, or four where you're dealing with skinny fat and likely uh, excess fat on your body. And it's just beyond frustrating. And at some point, most people just give up because they don't look like a biotype one, even though their doctor and everyone else promised them, if you just do the work, you're going to look just as good as so-and-so when you're not. And so... We have this, this obesity epidemic that is being fueled by social media. Mm-hmm. We have these social media folks who many of them don't have a biotype one either, but they're using filters, Photoshop, and they're putting up these unrealistic false images. Yeah. And that is fueling all these, especially young people who are trying to hold themselves to these completely unrealistic standards that they will never meet. And not because they aren't doing the hard work and not because you know, if they did everything right, then they still wouldn't look like that by type because their, their genes, their genetics simply won't allow it. So it, Skinny fat and body type directly correlates to the obesity epidemic. And the only way that we can fix that is helping to educate people. Why do you have a certain body type that you have? It's genetics, accepting your body type for what it is, and then finding the right diet, exercise, and lifestyle to maintain your specific body type so that you can come to terms with it, you can be happy with it as it is. And then maybe once you have done all those things and you have genuinely accepted your body for what it is, then you can look at some, uh, maybe some of our cutting edge exercises to 
you know, work on making your biotype better and getting more like a biotype one. But first, it's got to start with accepting and understanding your body for what it is relative to your genes and then finding the right diet, exercise, and lifestyle. And that is how we overcome the obesity epidemic and the general health crisis globally that we're dealing with. Right. Now, the first step, like you said, is understanding your body type. And you've created a body type quiz um, structure around the four body types that you have um, discovered in your research. Can you share with us a little overview of what, how the quid, quiz works, kind of what it entails um, if we were to take it so we can kind of get a good understanding of it? Yes. So um, first and foremost, we respect everyone's privacy and we are dead set on making sure that our website is safe so that you're not being shamed or trolled or bullied or no. so we allow for a pen name and we also don't do any face in terms of uh, of the images and um so so we can maintain your privacy um that being said what we're looking at is we do science science-based calculations in terms of diet exercise and lifestyle so we've taken the latest science uh that's always evolving. Uh, there's a few tweaks that we need to make. Like we currently still ask how many glasses of alcohol do you drink? Is it the two day standard for men, one day standard for women? The new science shows that it's really a one glass a day standard for men and a half glass for women. Mm -hmm. So we have to change that. But we are using the latest science to calculate our, our health scores. We are using the latest science relative to um, calculating out the vertebrae that are underdeveloped, the skinny fat that's on your body, the fat or excess fat that you put on your body in relation to that skinny fat. And then as well, we are calculating out the BMR uh, in terms of the Mifflin St. Gior and the Harris Bennett activity. So we are giving you your standard um, Mifflin uh, and we talk about it as either normal or slow. There's no way right now that we could possibly calculate a, a fast metabolism because we would have to know how much muscle mass that you have on your body. And there's just no way that you really know that accurately. So we can really only give you a slow or normal metabolism. And then we also um, calculate out the metabolic rate. And that is, that is relative to how much activity that you are doing in terms of cardio and in terms of resistance. Um, and then we also calculate in your work activity. So if you are, if you are a, uh, you know, if you're an elite athlete and you are running daily you know, versus a, a retail worker who's basically, uh, uh, or maybe a better example would be an office worker where you're sitting around all day. We calculate all, all of that so that we can get as accurate a metabolic rate as possible. And we, and we break all that down so that you can see it clearly on your quiz profile uh, so that you can get a better sense of your diet, exercise, and lifestyle in terms of your vertebrae and skinny fat and excess fat on your body so that then we come to your actual uh, body type identification. Uh, and that's a general overview of how we do it. Beautiful. And once we take the quiz and find out what our body type is, how do we utilize this information? Um, how can it help us with weight loss and fitness? It sounds like you also have programs around diet and exercise that correlate with the body types. Yes, we do. So we have a scientific weight loss program. We have the basic and advanced. The basic is just that it's basic. It, it just comes with less things and you can see that up on our website. The, uh, the, uh, the advanced uh, comes with more data output and it also uh, gives you access to the science-based Ask, Ask Gnosis team. Think of Ask Gnosis as like Siri or Alexa. Uh, we'll give you access to that science-based diet exercise and lifestyle team so that uh, you can ask any questions that you want about diet exercise and lifestyle. And we'll give you the, the latest science-based answer to your question. Um, and the, uh, so our weight loss diary, does, we are not in competition with MyFitnessPal or Calorie King or uh, Apple Health App. All those work great. And you can use those symbiotically with our diary. Our diary is based on the idea of holding yourself accountable. 
So you can see everything right there on your phone and you can share it with your friends and family. We moderate every comment on the site because again, we are not going to tolerate bullying, shaming, hating, trolling of any kind. Uh, but you can invite your friends and your family or your dietitian or your fitness pro and they can all use the uh, use the site for for free as well and track all of your scientific uh, diet exercise and lifestyle data. You can do as much or as little as you want. You can track your your uh, daily meals, your calories, and all the data relative to your diet. You can track all of your exercise, how intense it is, how long it is, uh, same with the exercise in terms of sleep and the quality of sleep, etc. And everyone can see what you want them to, to, to see in terms of what you add into your diary. And they can encourage you in, in, in the comments. And, and so. so the idea is, is you can see what your scientific body type is. You can then track everything so that you can clearly watch your actual progress. And when you get down within your safe BMI weight range, is mainstream science right? And you look just like the standard scientific human body, an animal body type one, or is the fellow one research right? And you don't. You're a body type one, body type two, or body type three, which is totally fine. But at least now you understand why. It's because you have skinny fat where you should have muscle and muscle mass, and that is genetics, and it is completely 100% fine. Let's just accept that, and here's all of our evidence. Yay. Right. Now, the million dollar question, though, can we change our body type if we're not born with a body type one? Is there any way to, you know, if we work real hard and do all the right things, can we kind of develop some of that muscle? Is it possible? Yes, you can. So I, I, I was born in a body type four. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll start off with the, with the caveat that I have developed my own regimen of proprietary exercises over the last 25 years. But I, I have turned my body from a body type 4 into a body type 2. And you can see my images up on, you can't see any of, of, of the old images when I was up around 300 pounds because that was in the mid 2000s. And the first iPhone didn't come out until 2007. And taking images is hard enough, even with an iPhone of yourself, let alone then when uh, it just wasn't really possible. So I don't really have any images of when I was pushing 300 pounds, but you can go and see, I am research participant, number one up on the site. You can go to the Biotype Science Research uh, data page. And you can go to the very last page at, at the bottom there is a search. And you can go to my profile, which is profile number one. And you can see, that uh, I have put on a lot of muscle mass in, in the last 25 years. So it is most certainly possible, but I, I'm not going to, no, it is not easy. Uh, it takes a, a, a lot of hard work, and honestly, it was a lot of hard, painful work because it's, it's building the muscle and muscle mass relative to the vertebrae where I was lacking all of that muscle mass. So I first started with yoga to get to know my vertebrae. Um, and then I sort of moved everything to a, to a standing up phase where I was doing a type of yoga standing up along with using weights. Uh, so I, I would mimic gravity or I do mimic gravity. So I'm adding more, more weight. And then it's just learning how to walk right. Uh, it's basically just one step after the other and paying attention to every step. And it's about feeling everything out. And so it is most certainly possible. I'm sorry that I can't give you more uh, details on those exercises. But yes, it is most certainly possible. And science is showing that it is most certainly possible to change your DNA. It's just not a quick or easy process. Uh, so I would say, yes, you most certainly can, but uh, let's be realistic about it and say, first, please just get to know what your real body type is. Get to know what a safe diet, exercise, and lifestyle is for your body type first. And then if you want to come to the site, you can buy single credits for the asthmosis, or you can do the scientific weight loss program. And you can ask us about those proprietary exercises, and we will feel more comfortable talking about it in that state once you've come to terms and, and accepted your body for what it is as it is right now. So is that fair? 
Absolutely. And for those that would like to do that and check out your body type quiz and learn more about body type science, where can we find you? And you also I think you mentioned you have a podcast. Do you have any other great resources on body type science you know, in relation to weight loss, diet, and fitness that we can all check out? Yeah, so uh, you can go to fellowone.com, uh, and, and that's where all of the research is on biotech science. And as I mentioned, we're the only biotech science in existence. We are the only scientific data on biotypes anywhere. Um, so that's up at fellowone.com. As I mentioned, the scientific biotech quiz, the scientific weight loss programs. And then uh, there's also a book uh, that tells the story of uh, my process, my journey of um, dealing with everything and coming to the actual research. Uh, the name of the book is called Overprivileged White Guy. But that's my book. Um, and then in terms of other resources, you can go out to social media. We do have the four biotypes. Uh, there are, uh, we are up on Twitter and Instagram, and TikTok, uh, and Facebook. And then we also do have Ask Gnosis accounts, I believe, is on Twitter and on Facebook. So you can go there. Uh, please keep in mind that we are very busy. But if you, if you ask us a question up on social media, we will do our best to answer it for you in a, in a timely manner. And that's one way that you we would like it if you went to the website and support our work by actually buying the, the, uh, the uh, Mass Nurses Credit or doing the Scientific Weight Loss Diary. But we understand that not everyone has those resources, so you can go to social media uh, and find us there. Uh, so I think that that covers everything. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, I'll post a link to all this below, your book, your social media, website, etc. Before we wrap up the show, do you have any final thoughts around the importance of body type science for those out there who may be struggling with weight loss, building muscle, or just wanting to feel and look more fit and toned? Yeah, I would simply say uh, it's really about coming to terms and accepting your your body for what it is. Uh, so, Social media is such a, a two-edged sword because uh, we use it for obvious reasons. It is a good way of getting out there and talking to people and educating them. But be very careful about the 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 body images that you see up there. Be very careful about any diet or exercise or lifestyle, especially weight loss nonsense. Mm-hmm. All of them are fads and gimmicks and just total unscientific nonsense that will only damage your 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 body. There are no quick fixes when it comes to weight loss. There are no pills. No matter what anyone tells you or tries to, to sell you, there's no such thing as a quick fix when it comes to weight loss. It's first about really following the science and recognizing that a calorie is not a calorie. That is old weight loss science. A calorie is not a calorie. Science is clear on that now, that if you eat a McDonald's French fry, it's most certainly not the same thing as eating a, a piece of broccoli. Yes, a, a French fry is a lot tastier, but they are not the same thing in terms of nutrients. So be careful about what you eat and what you put into your body in general. Eat whole foods over processed junk or fast foods, but do it in moderation. We don't want to tell folks that you can't eat fast or junk food every now and then I'll go out and have a Wendy's burger or something like that because that's life and you got to live, right? But food quality matters and uh, the, the, uh, the uh, glycemic index matters. That is essentially based on carbs. So you want to stick to a lower glycemic index so that you're not spiking your blood sugar. Uh, and, and all this is up on our site. Uh, but Eat quality, healthy foods. Recognize that a calorie is not a calorie. Don't follow that method. It doesn't work. Uh, and essentially, respect your body and realize that if there is no quick fix to weight loss. Choose a healthy diet, exercise, and lifestyle so that you can be healthy and sustainable for the long term. Mm, such important information. Well, thank you so much for joining me today and sharing your research and the importance of body type science. I learned so much. I thought I knew a lot, but this was so fascinating and to really learn about, you know, the history of the main, what we're told in mainstream to, you know, the science you're doing. It's, it's absolutely, you know, so important um, and really eye-opening helpful. So thank you so much for all the work that you're doing. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate being here. Remember, knowledge is power. The more you understand about your body, the better you're able to stay healthy and prevent disease. 
And a reminder, I'm not your doctor, so please don't take this as medical advice. If you have specific questions about your health care, feel free to reach out to your practitioner. And if you like this video, please like it and share it with others. This information could really help some you may know. And please hit that subscribe button to stay up to date on all our future shows. And join us next Wednesday for the next episode of Discovering True Health. Oh,